access uh, to the alliance, and as Professor Nozoe uh, referred to the, the vulnerability uh, that uh, the U.S. military presence uh, uh, as currently constituted poses uh, for uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance. And then there is, of course, uh, the military risk, uh, the increasing uh, challenges uh, that uh, uh, Japan and the United States uh, uh, faces, um, uh, very different from the time that uh, 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 Secretary uh, Perry served uh, in the Clinton uh, cabinets was definitely gotten uh, severe. So uh, the, the question is, you know, how, how does one manage the political risk versus uh, the military uh, risk? And if indeed, um, as the Japanese government likes to say, is it, you know, given these risks, uh, the current realignment plan, is it the only and best solution, or to put it more modestly, is it still the least uh, bad uh, uh, solution. So I wanted to ask more, uh, uh, given your long service in government and the opposition that uh, you faced uh, regarding the reversion of, of Okinawa, I mean, how do you think that the, uh, the U.S. government will think about the political risk versus uh, the military risk and challenges? And do you have any uh, suggestions um, that you could give to perhaps uh, the Japanese or uh, Governor Onaga about how to uh, move beyond the current stalemate that we seem to be in. It's a very uh, difficult situation. I think uh, <clears throat> what we had in, uh, in the 60s when we were confronting the version was a strong commitment, as I think there still is, on both sides to the maintenance of the alliance. But we also had people in the U.S. government who were willing to look with sympathy at the political situation in Japan and to reach the conclusion that the United States was running a significant risk to the alliance, to the bases in Japan, uh, if it did not make some move on Okinawa. And the scenario that those of us who were making this argument painted went back to the 1960 riots. What we suggested was that there was a risk that there would be comparable outbreak of, of anti-American, anti-alliance activity, uh, which would have two unfortunate consequences. One, it would reveal to both sides the fragility of the alliance, and perhaps encourage those in Japan we thought they had a chance of actually ending the war. But second, we would be forced to make changes in the base structure that would be seen by everybody to be the result of opposition pressure rather than our own decisions. And so what we persuaded the American government was that if you balance those risks, uh, you wanted to move when you could say we were doing this to strengthen the alliance. We were doing this on the basis of an agreement between people in both governments who care deeply about maintaining the alliance, rather than under pressure from a political movement, at least some of whose members wanted to end the alliance and were pressing to do so. Now that required trust between the U.S. government and the Japanese government, because the Japanese government's greatest fear was that it would make a demand on the return of Okinawa, and then it would not, the U.S. would not respond, or in the later stages, the U.S. would respond but say, but we have to keep the nuclear weapons there. And then the agreement would fall apart, and the Japanese government would be left exposed to having said we can't tolerate the, the continued occupation of Okinawa, and then have to do so. And we then encourage the forces who are trying to drive the alliance apart. I think the same situation is here now, but I think we're lacking in both the U.S. government and the Japanese government uh, the people and forces that are needed to make this work. There has to be some people in Japan who say to the U.S. government, this is too risky, we've been doing this now for, what is it, how many years is it since the base was announced? 20 years. 22 And it's time to say that Japan as a democracy cannot deliver on that. And the U.S. side has to say, we appreciate, we understand the efforts that have been made, 
we will now work with you to find the different solutions. And once you start looking, once you get over this notion that there is no option, then you find that there are lots of options, and they have different amounts of degradation, and the degradations can be overcome. The question we always asked was, what are the things we do now on Okinawa? And could we continue to do them under mainland rules? And how much degradation would be if we did them under mainland rules? And if we had to move them off Okinawa, where else could we put them? And how much degradation would there be? Then you had to weigh that against the threat to the alliance of just saying no. And I think we need to do the same thing now. I don't see any sign, and I did, I have to say, in previous American administrations, any willingness uh, to do that. When you had a Japanese government that was trying to do that, it was, in my view, unfortunately stonewalled by the American uh, administration. Uh, well, I, I want to uh, turn to uh, both uh, Professor Nozoe and, and uh, Eric uh, Hegelbotten uh, on this uh, uh, point about uh, possible alternatives. Uh, and you know, I think um, looking at it from the uh, viewpoint of people who played a key role uh, in uh, first the discussions that led to the, the SOCO report in 1996, uh, and then the 2005 agreement uh, based on the Defense uh, Policy Review Initiative, the Deeper Initiative, uh, I think they would think that that's exactly what they were doing, that they were uh, seeing the potential risks uh, in the future and therefore uh, they came up with a plan that would reduce uh, the burden on Okinawa uh, while maintaining uh, the critical operational uh, requirements. But Professor Nozoe, uh, I think what you are saying is that uh, in the eyes of uh, the people of Okinawa, that this was not uh, enough, uh, that even if uh, the Henneco plan went through uh, and FDEMA was closed, uh, that this would not lead uh, to kind of stabilization of the situation in Okinawa, that there would still be risks. So I guess, uh, uh, why do you feel that there were those risks and what uh, kind of realistic options do you uh, think there are and, and what kinds of options might be emerging uh, from Japan uh, or uh, Okinawa? Uh, thank you. Uh, the first point, is, uh, I'd like to uh, point three points. Uh, Firstly, uh, the major still majority of the Okinawan people have been uh, have opposed the relocation plan uh, because uh, they feel they felt they have felt that the relocation plan is not the relo uh, reduction of the burden but uh, the uh, strength of the burden. That uh, maybe the many uh, officials of the U.S. government and the Japanese government uh, denied this. But I think the feeling of Okinawan people is a uh, bit more important. So uh, I think that that uh, we have to pay attention to the fact that the, the majority of Okinawan people have be have uh, resisted the relocation plan. That we have to uh, see this point. The second point is that the. The, now, the Okinawan people's resistance uh, focuses on the uh, relocation uh, of FEMA uh, Air Force to Henoko, uh, not uh, all air base, or all, all U.S. base in Okinawa. And the, the uh, Dr. Hagi uh, uh point out, that point is very important, but the the, now the problem is uh, the FEMA Air Base and the Marine, U.S. Marine Corps. So if we uh, uh, ignore the, this Okinawa people's feeling, uh, I'm afraid that the, the Okinawa people's resistance pro spread from the just the Marine Corps uh, to the all U.S. Marine, U.S. bases in Okinawa, including the more highly important Cardinal Air Base. Yes. Uh, that is, uh, uh, I, I'd like to point out. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and, and Eric, uh, uh, just addressing the, the, the same question, um, you uh, referred to uh, the notion of operational resilience and uh, 
uh, certainly active uh, defense and especially through uh, ballistic missile defense and, and hardening is, is one way of going at it and that's uh, being done. Uh, but then uh, there's also the issue of dispersion and mobility. Uh, if uh, U.S. Uh, uh, defense planners and Japanese defense planners were to work, uh, uh, focus much more on the dispersion and mobility side, do you see opportunities uh, that might go beyond uh, deep root? Uh, 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 you know, that would make uh, U.S. military uh, 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 operational resilience uh, more effective and more efficient, but then at the same time have the payoff of uh, reducing further uh, the burden on Okinawa. So, you know, as you stipulated up, uh, you know, up front, the issue is balancing operational risk and political risk. And, you know, can you do that and still strengthen the, the alliance's military capabilities? And I think if you approach this, uh, you know, from, from a blank slate, and if there were a political commitment on both sides, yes, you could probably uh, you could probably reduce both forms of risk, uh, and you could improve operational resiliency and lower the, uh, in a number of ways anyway, lower the, the political uh, risks. So, at, you know, at one point, uh, certainly Japan, the United States, to a certain extent, pursued sort of a, a, a forward defense, sort of static uh, approach to its defense facilities. Um, we were operating from very large fixed main operating bases. We could probably move away from that model. Um, there are questions about whether the Marines have to be there, and I think you know we've already talked about that quite a bit today. But in, in my view, no, they don't have to be there. Um, the question, I think, at least from the U.S. military perspective, becomes there's maybe a third type of risk or a different type of political risk, which is if they make an agreement, you know, will it be honored? Um, and you know, that's not just a question of, uh, uh, of, of Japan's commitment to honoring its agreement. It's, it's really the political continuity and the continuity of the commitment by both national governments as well as Okinawa and how these things uh, uh, fit with evolving um, strategic, the evolving strategic environment. Um, so I think there's sort of a risk aversion from the standpoint of the U.S. military that if it agrees to certain things, some of those may not be executed upon. But as far as some specifics, you know, again, I could imagine something that goes beyond SACO as far as the scale of our, uh, of our presence, but there are other things written into the guidelines, the U.S.-Japan defense guidelines, as they already exist, about the opening of civilian infrastructure and the increased use of dual-use facilities so that you can actually execute this kind of mobile strategy where your forces don't have to be in Okinawa, but they can flow to Okinawa. Um, but, you know, a lot of those agreements haven't really been fully implemented. There have only been site surveys of a few civilian airports. It's not a hard task. It just hasn't been done. There are a lot of bureaucratic obstacles. So if that could be done, and if you actually exercise this capability, and if folks had confidence that those facilities would actually be uh, available in a crisis, I think, yes. Okay, well, uh, I'd like to uh, open the floor uh, to, uh, to questions. Okay, so and, Andrew. Uh, Thank you, Andrew Yocantz of University. Uh, I wanted to ask something uh, based on Dr. Hickenbottom's talk, but I think this can be answered by anyone on the panel. Uh, you had mentioned a changing alliance strategy uh, for the U.S. and Japan. And you know, as we move forward, you know, I'm thinking, if, let, let's say that there is uh, a strategic uh, answer to a uh, potential replacement somewhere in, in mainland Japan. So let's assume that those requirements are sufficiently met. If we move to the political uh, arena, I mean, how, I mean, how likely is it that the government of Japan would be, it would be how likely would the government of Japan uh, be willing to endorse such a plan. And I'm curious because right now there might be a, a window of opportunity with increased threats and with you know, the strengthening of the U.S.-Japan alliance. Would, uh, under these conditions, would the Japanese government be willing to, again, put more 
capital, uh, political capital into uh, a survey or looking for uh, potential replacement sites in in uh, mainland Japan. Thanks. So actually, I think that's probably more a question for uh, Professor Nozoe since it has to do with political willingness on the part of Japan. But um, yeah. I mean, I think we're talking about a relocation of one base, but again, I, I guess I, I would emphasize this, the need for more, more bases, or at least access to more points, right, and more facilities. Um, and I, I don't see a whole lot of willingness yet to do that, but I think you're right, there's an opportunity here, people's awareness in Japan of, of the threat has certainly been highlighted by Korea, so, um, you know, in my view, there, there should be an opportunity. Oh, thank you. Um, the, now, the Prime Minister Abe is very uh, hard to the implement the relocation plan at Hanover. Uh, in the Diet, Prime Minister Abe said uh, they have uh, sought the other options, but the politically, the uh, Hanover is the uh, best option. So uh, he decided to uh, uh, implement the relocation, he said so. So his remarks but outraged, uh, fewer outrage in Okinawa. This is a discrimination. Uh, not the, uh, many uh, Japanese officials repeatedly say that the, not the military reason, but the political reason is the relocation of them to Hanover. Uh, so uh, I don't know the political uh, military uh, perspective, but the political reason is the relocation of them uh, to Hanover inside of Okinawa is a very uh, increased uh, discrimin uh, uh, discontinuous of Okinawa right now. Yeah, I mean, I think there is, a, in both Japan and the United States, a feeling that they made this deal and that somehow they have to keep the deal, that otherwise, if we give in, say, we'll give you another option, it uh, shows a weakening of the alliance or a weakening of the commitment uh, to the alliance. And so each country is waiting for the other to say, even for Japan to say, we just can't deliver on it, or for the United States to say, now there's a changing military environment. And that seems to me the much better basis to do this. The two governments should come together and say, in light of the changing Chinese threats, in light of the growing North Korean threat, we've reevaluated what we need much more important is the concept of joint bases and the use of civilian bases. So every Japanese military base in Japan should in principle be open to American military forces. That, as I understand it, is not the case now. I don't really understand that. And that in the context of that, they could say the resources that are available, which are never as much as you want, are better used to create this jointness and this flexibility to use civilian bases and to build this runway out in the middle of this beautiful border. Those of you who have not seen it, I urge you to go. Uh, if you're an environmentalist, you'll have a different perspective on what this is on what this is all about. But clearly, we can say, look, many years have passed since we made this political decision that this was the best alternative. We now face a very different Chinese threat, a very different North Korean threat. Much other things are much more urgent resources should go to them and we should change from this plan not because Japan is forcing the United States to give up or the United States is doubting Japanese ability to deliver but because we're in a new situation. I think that would be in the security interest of both sides. And, and I think one of the issues is probably in the Japanese government uh, there is a tendency to uh, tolerate more risks uh, and political costs in Okinawa uh, rather than uh, on any kinds of options uh, on the main uh, islands. Sure. Okay, um, Professor Ramson. I'm Steve Ramson. As I mentioned this morning, I was stationed in Hanover at the Ordnance Depot there before we person when it started nuclear weapons. I have a question for Dr. Halpern. Quite a bit of controversy was stirred uh, in Japan in the last few weeks by a statement attributed to Mr. Akiba Takeo, who is a high foreign ministry official. Uh, the statement was quoted in an article published by the Association of Concerned Scientists, I think they're here today. And it was based supposedly on a memo 
of February 27, 2009, entitled Discussion with Japanese Political Counselor Akiba Takeo. Now, um, from what I understand, this memo is based on notes that was taken by someone um, uh, who was present at the meeting. I'm not going to ask you who that person was. I'm just going to ask you, do you have confidence in the person's professional skills and uh, uh, competence uh, uh, to do this job? And um, also, do you doubt in any way the accuracy of the, the summary that, of the notes that were taken and the resulting uh, uh, article that was published? Uh, before I, I have uh, Dr. Halpert answer that question, for those that uh, do not know uh, uh, what uh, Professor Rapson is referring to uh, is a uh, congressional mandated uh, commission uh, called America's uh, Strategic uh, Posture, uh, I believe, uh, and uh, uh, Secretary Perry was the chair uh, of that uh, commission, and James Hussinger was the co-chairman, I believe, uh, Dr. Halpern, you were a, a member of that uh, commission. Yes, you should have asked Dr. Perry that question. <laughs> in fact, the chair of that commission. Um, I have no basis on which to challenge the accuracy, the accuracy of the material that has been released, nor any reason to question the confidence and integrity of the people involved. <laughs> So, um, obviously I wasn't there, but um, <laughs> the, I think the, the, the notes uh, referred to Japan's desire to see a uh, you know, flexible uh, U.S. nuclear force posture with strong hints that there was a desire for the U.S. to maintain a tactical nuclear capability. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, again, can't speak to that particular event, but uh, Kono Taro came out immediately after the United States released its new nuclear posture review and said he very much appreciated uh, the content of that nuclear posture review and that the NPR, the new NPR, is a return uh, to uh, <clears throat> at least bring back parts of our tactical nuclear warfighting capability. So there's a, there is a certain type of consistency there, I think, over time in, in Japan's view. Well, from Dr. Hopper, uh, if I could just follow up on that. I mean, you've uh, written uh, eloquently for many years on the whole issue of nuclear deterrence, and sending nuclear deterrence. Uh, you know, given the, uh, the changing uh, military uh, balance, uh, you know, how critical do you feel is uh, uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, for maintaining the robustness of extended uh, nuclear deterrence? I think they're irrelevant. I've always thought so and continue to believe so. The, the issue was, as was said, uh, whether the Japanese government would agree that the U.S. nuclear deterrence for Japan could be effectively implemented without the development and the maintenance of tactical nuclear weapons that might be brought back into the uh, European theater. And of course, the Japanese government has always had this contradictory position. On the one hand, Many people in the Japanese government thought some presence of tactical nuclear weapons in the theater was important. On the other hand, the Japanese government made it clear that it did not tolerate the presence of American nuclear weapons on Japanese territory. Uh, and I think that was true in Europe as well, where there were many, some Europeans who thought tactical nuclear weapons were necessary and others who thought they were unacceptable. Uh, my view is that the credibility of the nuclear deterrent in any situation has to do with the alliance relationship, with the confidence of the people being defended that the United States will honor its security commitments and not whether nuclear weapons will be used initially, which I do not think they should be, or nor where they are located. Uh, and with playing that out now in the Korean situation as well, I think it's much more important that the Korean government and the Korean people understand that the United States has a security commitment to Japan, which requires it to do whatever is necessary to defend South Korea, and that it will do that uh, regardless of where the nuclear weapons are stationed. That was exactly the issue in Japan. The Japanese government has always been split on the issue, and its public position has always been different than some of its private positions. 
on, on that question. I think in that round, which led to the uh, to the Obama administration's position, there was finally, I think, complete agreement that the tactical cruise missile was not necessary. And that's being reopened again by the same people who were had that position at the time. The, these the people and the positions never changed. It seems to be working on nuclear weapons seems to be good for your longevity. Because people stay <laughs> in the field for a very long time and never change their views. But uh, one other element in the way uh, extended uh, deterrence works is, is not just the reassurance uh, that allies want, uh, but how the target of extended deterrence uh, sees uh, uh, things. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, Eric, uh, um, if you're looking at it from the Chinese uh, perspective and whether you're uh, looking at it uh, at the Senkaku issue or the Taiwan issue, uh, first of all, uh, how important or how significant is having tactical nuclear weapons uh, to uh, shaping uh, the calculations of China? And then when you were talking about the same countries, you mentioned the importance of, of access to airfields. Uh, and um, I guess, you know, someone who's looked at the Senkaku issue uh, and the inherent value of Senkaku uh, I just find it mind-boggling uh, that China might uh, actually take the risk of seizing the Senkakus so that uh, the United States would need to have access of all of those airfields uh, in order to deter uh, China. So you've been a student of Chinese uh, military thinking. Uh, what's your take on this? Right, those are great, great questions. They're both enormous questions. Um, Briefly on the nuclear side, uh, you know, uh, one could make arguments on the nuclear side about, you know, whether they, these might be useful in a Korea contingency. But uh, just speaking to China, China has a no first use nuclear policy, and unlike the Soviet Union during the Cold War, it's actually built a force structure that's consistent with that. It's quite credible. Um, uh, its force structure is evolving today, but it has abjured some of the capabilities it would need for a war fighting strategy. So it does not maintain tactical nuclear weapons uh, at present. Um, it doesn't have a launch on warning. In fact, it doesn't even make, for the most part, its missiles and, and, uh, and warheads. Um, so return to uh, you know, greater emphasis on actual war fighting in our deterrent posture, I think, could push China in ways that are certainly not in our interests as far as uh, uh, you know, driving them to, to, to rethink some of their nuclear calculations about both force structure and potentially about, uh, about their, their doctrine. Um, so that's uh, on the nuclear side. As far as the Senkakus are concerned, a absolutely in agreement with you that uh, they're not worth a war. I don't think China would ever calculate that they're worth a war with the United States. Uh, the reason, though, that I think it's worth thinking about conflict over this that, that, that springs from, from the Senkakus and the dispute over the Senkakus is that you can certainly imagine a clash there. You've got military assets in close proximity, you've got risk-taking behavior. Ho you know, hopefully we can have more discussions with the Chinese and reduce that risk-taking behavior. But now China has more and more assets that it can put farther and farther out from the coast. So you've got these assets in close proximity. If something, you know, if a clash occurred, if a small clash maybe sparked by an accident or by uh, you know, local commanders. There is an issue that, you know, if China were in danger of losing this, it could uh, regain its advantage in a local sense by escalating the conflict. So if you have one air base, and that's where the Japanese are operating from in Okinawa, China has all these missiles that could, you know, they could look to use this capability to prevent uh, Japan from gaining an advantage in, in that local area. So I think we want to look at that escalation chain and how, um, you know, how deterrence plays out within that once you, you know, once you have a conflict. You want a posture that, uh, that doesn't provide incentives for the Chinese side to, to escalate the conflict. Um, any questions, other questions from uh, Ms. Kelly? 
hesitate to return to Fatima, but just a word of caution, really. For 20, 22 years, we've been hearing that we need a plan B, we need another plan. And I would just remind everyone, as part of my question, that 1997 there was a plan, 2004, 2005, 2009, when the Democratic Party came into power and Dr. Yama and the Gaddafi came back. This, this has been looked at many times. And many times people say, we need to find a better plan, but nobody has a plan. And I would just remind everyone that if you accept the need operationally for a runway for the Marine Corps that's co-located with the training ranges and the ground forces and the support forces so that they can train together on an integrated basis. That's why you have to have the helicopters in Okinawa close so that they can train. Otherwise, the Marines lose their capability as a rapid response force. They're the only rapid response ground forces we have in the Western Pacific or in Okinawa. But if you accept that, then the question is, how can you reduce the burden by removing the runway? And every time it's been looked at, and every time someone like Hatoyama with the DPJ government, who fundamentally opposed, who came up with the idea of just moving it out of Vietnam, once they look at it, it all comes back to Ken Schwab at Hinoko. So if anybody has, and for not just for political reasons, primarily for physical reasons, because of the need for being integrated and co-located, there's just nowhere else to move the runway. And it's not a new base, it's an existing base. So my question is, if might, when people propose the two governments getting together, I mean, if you've got a concrete proposal, you might get some traction with both governments. But unless you have a concrete proposal, if you have, I'd like to hear it. I think everybody, the governor and others, would like to hear it. My other question, quick question from the I was just puzzled why you were surprised to see in the U.S. Japan defense guidelines that the primary response for defending the Senkaku is the, grand, is the Japanese self-defense forces. Of course it's the Japanese self-defense forces. The, the fundamental meaning of the alliance is not that the U.S. defends Japan. It's that Japan and the U.S. defend Japan together. That, that's why I think the U.S. side welcomes so much the progress in the last five years under the Abe administration in terms of building resources and collective self-defense and a lot of the fundamental things that have taken place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I agree with your opinion, but what I'd like to say is that many general Japanese people regard the U.S. Marines as an uh, uh, important role to the defense of uh, Senkoku Islands. I also agree with you and many Japanese officials and Japanese specialists uh, see that the role of the defense of Senkoku Islands is Japan's role. I think, I also think so. But, uh, the problem is that the many Japanese people and the Japanese government also explain publicly that the Marine Corps is important because the defense of Senkaku Islands. That uh, explanation and such an attitude uh, leads to the Japanese dependence on the U.S. military uh, commitment to the defense of Senkaku Islands. Yes. Yeah, but such an explanation and such a viewpoint uh, make a Japanese government policy, but cause, uh, I'm afraid, such a uh, problem. So, uh, I, I guess you're talking about a potential moral hazard uh, problem. Okay, any other uh, questions? Uh, mm -hmm. more, more. Okay, one last question and then I'll wrap up. Victor Hokim again, a very simple question, very short. To what extent will the obvious proposal constitutional amendment affect Okinawa military bases and then U.S.-Japan relations as well? Just simple question, but answer also maybe hopefully simple. But I don't know. And, and, and that's the assumption that there will be a constitutional amendment. Well. Constitutional amendment, to what extent does Abe's proposal for the constitutional amendment affect or impact the U.S. basis in Okinawa? And, and that's, the, that's his modest proposal of essentially recognizing uh, the self 
or defense force. Whatever you want to take it, but a simple question up to you. Sure, so, you know, I, <laughs> I can't spe speak to that specific question. I think it would have a marginal effect, but I, there's a larger trend here, which is, I, as I think Mike put it, I'm not sure whether it was during the break or not, that, you know, we have this movement towards a real alliance, and that's got tremendous and profound implications for how we think about a basing and force posture on Okinawa Island and through the view queues. You know, we really do have this potential for joint basing. Most of our bases now are joint. Um, the SDF is very uh, keen to, to engage and participate in joint basing. We don't, have, we don't have combined command, but we have coordination, and the coordination centers are now being built together on the ground, so you know, we're making real progress. We have uh, air training relocation and ATR program, so units are moving around, U.S. air units move out to Japanese bases and, and train, and I think you know, we can do more and more of this. Uh, you know, the, again, key piece that's missing here is, I think, the use of civilian bases and maybe institutionalizing some of this in new ways. So ATR, air training relocation is done, you know, in the framework of noise mitigation, even though it's really training and movement, familiarization. Um, so we could go farther with this. Uh, and to the extent we do, um, you know, I think this opens up new vistas and new opportunities. Yeah, I, I think all of this is is valuable if it is done in the context of the Japanese government continuing to recognize the concerns of the rest of Asia stemming from the legacy of past Japanese behavior. Uh, the most important thing in my view is to actually get an alliance with Japan and Republic of Korea and the United States. And what's lacking in that is the willingness of those two countries, not the United States. The United States would like to see that. And I think also, Japan putting to rest all of what remains of the concerns about uh, the period of the Second World War. I think it's moving very far in that direction. I think there's still some more things to be done. I think the problem with the con constitutional change, I think it would have no effect at all. I think Japan has ignored what its constitution said for a very long time. Uh, and, you know, it used to have self defense forces, not a defense ministry. It's gradually changed since then. So I think if the Constitution was amended, it would make no difference. What I think it would do in the current context is further split the Japanese people. Uh, and it is very difficult to maintain effective alliances when a substantial portion of, the con of your people think it is unacceptable, inappropriate to do so. So I think. Japan has to build its relationships uh, with its own people and with its neighbors. And when it does that, amending of the Constitution will become irrelevant, but also easy to do if Japan wants to do it. To do it in the absence of that, I think, is to run risks for no reason, because there's, there's no effective limit on what Japan can do that it needs to amend the Constitution. Uh, yeah, I think that the I don't think that the amendment of the constitution affects the uh, be Okinawa base program. I think that is a problem yes. because in 1950s, a Japanese politician uh, thought uh, they should amend the constitution in order to be independent, uh, more independent from the United States and uh, be more reduced in order to reduce U.S. military presence. But now, the maybe Prime Minister Abe uh, maybe think that, uh, that, that keeping the U.S. military presence, particularly in Okinawa, uh, the Japan Self-Defense Force, uh, should uh, be uh, building built out. Uh, in this situation, uh, maybe many Okinawan people uh, think that the, the, uh, without the reducing of the base burden, the, the Self-Defense Force uh, will grow. That is, more problem. Uh, so that is, uh, I think, that's a very big problem. So I hope at least some politician uh, think that the, uh, if Japan uh, build up the, the her military force, uh, in expense of that, the uh, Okinawa U.S. military base uh, should be decreased. Okay. Um. Uh, before I uh, just give a, a couple of, uh, uh, make a couple of points as a wrap-up, I want to uh, 
take this opportunity to thank uh, all the panelists, uh, Dr. Halperin, uh, Professor Nozoe, and Dr. Higginbotham uh, for their uh, excellent uh, insights uh, into this very complex issue. So, I also want to uh, thank uh, Governor Onaga and uh, Secretary Perry and Professor Yo uh, for their participation in the morning uh, uh, part of the program. Uh, I also want to thank uh, all the many people who uh, worked hard uh, to put this conference uh, together. Uh, uh, the staff uh, members of Washington Sport, James Tetlo, uh, Mayuko uh, Yatsu, uh, uh, Kyoshi Nagasaka, and, and many others. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the interpreters. I know uh, interpreting is, is uh, a very difficult task, and especially uh, for uh, uh, issues as complicated as the ones that we discussed today. So please uh, uh, join me. In the I just uh, do not have the ability to uh, to wrap up uh, in a single fashion all of the, the many insights, but also very important questions that were raised in this conference. I guess I would just uh, leave you with a couple of thoughts. The one, uh, uh, looking at it from the Okinawa perspective, I think uh, what uh, many of those who were speaking uh, on behalf of the voices in Okinawa uh, was basically telling us uh, that there are enormous risks uh, still at play uh, regarding uh, the U.S. military bases in, in Okinawa. Uh, it's the political uh, risk. And as I think about the, the future schedule about uh, the construction of the, uh, the FDEMA replacement uh, facility, uh, much less uh, uh, the whole issue of uh, when FDEMA will be returned, but it could be a, 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 another decade or even more uh, before Futemba is returned. And one of the things that we have to be aware of is if there is an accident, uh, the explosive effect that uh, such an accident uh, may have on the people of Okinawa. I think the other message, and I think this is probably uh, a message uh, to the people of Okinawa, uh, and I think it was articulated uh, very nicely by Professor uh, Yo is that uh, if Okinawa wants to move the needle on this uh, discussion, uh, it needs uh, to engage uh, the security consensus uh, that exists between the United States and Japan. And uh, what's happened is that this consensus has tightened uh, rather than loosened uh, over time. I mean, I probably do agree with uh, Kevin Mayer that Given the assumptions uh, that Mr. Mayor was making, uh, probably there is no other plan uh, that is better than the one that currently exists. But I think uh, what may be called for is to move beyond those assumptions uh, and think about some kind of paradigm uh, shift. And so if this conversation is to continue in a more productive fashion, I think it's uh, much more important than uh, the voice of Okinawa uh, to link up uh, with uh, the security policy community in both the United States uh, and uh, Japan. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for attending this conference uh, and for your attention and for your questions. And I want to thank uh, again uh, Governor Onanda and Okinawa Prefectural uh, uh, Government. And I was just uh, 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 reminded that uh, please uh, return your translation devices in a box uh, in the back. Uh, in, in the